All right, with that, I'm going to um, introduce our speaker today. We have with us Paul Conrad, who is the Director of Training and Workforce Development with the Aspen Network in Indiana. And probably a year and a half ago, Paul uh, gave us a presentation on the um, generational gaps or workforce uh, generational gaps. And he's going to kind of do a, a part two on that for us today. He got um, it was a very well attended webinar. And and uh, everyone seems really interested in this, this topic, so we thought it might be good to revisit it. And um, Paul has um, created a nice presentation for us to help us better understand global and millennials. And so I'm going to switch screens and then turn it over to you, Paul. All right, thank you, Angie. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart for many reasons. First of all, our grant deals with these generations. But uh, in full disclosure, I am the parent of two globals, a 15-year-old uh, and a 17-year-old. So what motivates them on a personal level is very important to me. So, and I have actually gotten some of my information by going, I'm, I was a history teacher and a history major, and I like to use primary source uh, materials. So I've, I've asked questions of my, uh, my, particularly my older son, the 17 year old, and, and some of his friends to, to find out uh, not just academic research, but the real thing. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I want to briefly review uh, the different generations in the workplace. Uh, that's kind of a carryover from my first presentation, but I have updated it. Then we're going to discuss the differences between millennials and globals in the workplace, and, and there are some very extreme differences. I'm going to discuss what motivates these two generations. Uh, again, very different. And then discuss the long-term impact of that changing uh, workforce and the workplace in general. And uh, I think that I've, I've noticed amongst my peers, and again, in full disclosure, I am a uh, last last generation, our last of the year range um, baby boomer, probably gener uh, identify more with Gen X, but uh, I think that these generations are causing a lot of angst uh, in, in the workplace, and, and there's some good Good, good reasons for that. So let's review the demographics. Um, if, if you attended my first presentation, you'll notice something uh, starkly and glaringly different from this chart, because I'm sure everybody has it burned into their minds. But I've taken the traditionalists off the uh, generations. Um, I did first started doing this training, I've been doing it quite a few years now in, in different versions. And we're getting to the point where your traditionalist generation, the, the youngest of them is 74 years old. And so I don't think that they really are having much of an impact anymore on the workforce uh, per se, as far as full-time employment. Most of that generation has retired or might be working part-time. So. I'd kind of drop them off, off, and if you're one of those people, I apologize for dropping you off, um, but uh, I'd have. So first of all, uh, I want to review the date ranges. Um, as we're speaking primarily about millennials and globals, uh, I'll, I'll stick with that. And you can see that millennials, uh, I'm going with the age group of 1980 to 1995. So I forgot to update that one number. In 2018, they're 
between the ages of 23 and 38. Sorry about that. And globals. Uh, and the date ranges I'm sticking with there are 1996 to 2016. And so the oldest of those folks uh, this year will be 22. So there are quite a few of them in in the in the workforce. And may, many of you may be saying, Paul, why are you using the term globals? Everybody uses Generation Z. Well, there's a good reason. And first and foremost, this is one of those things that I went to the source. Um, most people who use Gen Z are baby boomers or older Gen Xers. I asked this new generation, what do you call your generation? And the response was overwhelmingly globals. Um, because it reflects, and I love this, the, reflects the fact that our generation is connected globally. And we'll talk more about connecting how, how this generation connects. Um, a lot of the popular, if you're reading a lot of uh, the terms, and I inadvertently left that off the slide, is iGen. Um, and they did not like that. The people I asked in an interview did not like that term because it implies loyalty to a specific brand, which I thought was interesting because I think when most boomers or Gen Xers use that term, they don't really connect it specifically with a brand. But this generation is so in tune with electronics and technology that to them, iGen is a branding says that they all use Apple products, for example. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And they didn't like Gen Z because a, just a, they didn't like X, Y, Z. It, it lacked all imagination. So that, that's what I got. So that's how I got. And I'm going to stick with, a glowing, going against maybe some of the trends, the term global throughout my presentation because I, I do think it's apt. You can see the size of the generations. Um, the baby boomers, and I, I couldn't find some statistics, but it's it's still fairly accurate. Uh, obviously, the baby boomer generation is shrinking uh, as, as people you know get older. That happens. Uh, Gen Z is, is pretty much the, the same. Uh, you can see the Millennials are 75.9 million, and the globals are currently 23 million and growing. So you can do the math. Uh, you can see that millennials and globals um, are big. Let's just leave it there. All right. Some distinguishing workplace characteristics, and again, this is kind of a review from my my last uh, presentation, but again, been updated. Probably the most uh, most important thing, again, with the with the two generations are the millennials and globals, is is that technology uh, component. Um, Millennials are that first generation that really started to embrace uh, and, and, and have technology be an integral part of their lives and their workplace. Um, with the globals, it is absolutely critical, the concept of the Internet of Everything. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but that's essentially uh, not only do we have a we have a tablet, we have a computer, we have a phone, but some of our appliances and our uh, uh, other things in our home are all tied together in the internet. For example, I don't know how many of you I have one. I think it's kind of cool. Have, have a a, thermo, um, a thermostat that I can log into an app on my phone. 
home here at work and, and change the thermostat at home. And, and as we get more things like Alexa and all those uh, tools that can control uh, components down to a granular level of our lives, that, that's what we call the Internet of Everything. And of course, that crosses over to the workplace. Uh, for these two generations, work is needs to be flexible, and we'll go into that. And the concept, if you haven't heard this, that the gig workplace. This is particularly true with millennials. Not, we'll talk about it, that concept in globals as we move forward. But uh, also, both of these generations uh, primarily think that authority must be earned, that you don't get, uh, you're not instantly respected um, just for having put in your time, which is very different than the way most baby boomers and Gen Xers look at uh, authority in the workplace. So, so that causes a little bit of friction sometimes. And also, um, Workplace view time at work um, for these two generations again it is um, not necessarily uh, the same as boomers and Gen Xers in that we have all this technology we should be using it and we'll go into that in detail in a minute. So let's meet the globals again, 1996 to 2016. As a review, the oldest of these people uh, generation is turning 22 in 2018. Uh, they're about 25% of the population. Uh, yeah. Other names again, gamer generation, digital natives, generation Z, iGen, or centennials. It's all used interchangeably. Some facts about this generation. They have never known a world without the internet and smartphones. Ever. Even some millennials didn't have the kind of technology they have now. They've only known two presidents. Sure, there was one before for the older ones, but they were little kids then, and they, they don't remember, uh, probably don't remember George Bush. And be that as it may, they've only known those two presidents and all that, uh, the ideology that went with those two guys. 33% um, of these folks watch lessons online, read textbooks on tablets, and work with classmates online. Um, particularly at the college level, um, there are most most classes, and I've been I've been asking. Uh, we were interviewing for a position here. One of the questions was, if, "Have you used?" Uh, have you used a webinar software? And every single applicant said yes. I took college, if nothing else, they took college classes and they used webinars to meet with students in either study groups or um, uh, with their professors. Interestingly enough, two thirds said that they were concerned about being able to afford college and that $100 a month was a was a loan payment that they said was manual, um, manageable, excuse me. Now, my research said that the average monthly student loan payment is $242. So uh, some of them are in for a shot. 72%, uh, and this is updated from even the last time I did this presentation, a version of this presentation. 72% expect to work for themselves in their career. 
which is very interesting in that uh, seven, uh, about right now, about 11% of America, working Americans are self-employed. So a huge entrepreneurial uh, spirit in this new generation uh, with the global polls. And they also save money. This is a big change from the millennial generation, and we'll, we'll dive into that too. Oops, hold on. There we go. Sorry, wrong button. Um, they are more willing. This the globals are more willing to uh, relocate, work nights, weekends, those, those kind of things, um, than the millennials, which is. Probably if you're an employer, you're going, oh, finally. Um, they are seeking more, more stability in their careers, which I find refreshing. Um, one of the surveys that I was used for this said that they only plan to change job an average jobs at an average of two, or excuse me, three to four times. Um, they want to find, however, an employer who who is worth their loyalty, which is an interesting thing. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes when we talk about motivators and what, what it is that makes you worth their loyalty. I want you to think about that, con that concept, though, is that um, they're not necessarily out there begging for a job. They're looking for the employer that fits them, okay? Um, the globals are not motivated by the fancy cafeterias and beanbag chairs uh, as many of the millennials were. Surprisingly enough, they do like face-to-face -face communication in the workplace. Um, they will communicate with each other using uh, technology, but when it comes to the workplace, they do want to see some face to face. Now, that does not mean don't go, oh, finally, the uh, generation that wants to come into the office. No. Uh, they want to engage one on one with their leaders. And one of the motivators, I kind of have a giveaway here, that um, some of the corporate surveys have shown that mentorship programs are one of the most important things and if you notice this behind health care on the list of most important benefits that a global is looking for so because of all this new technology and the way things change. A lot of globals have been educated in uh, different different ways. Um, lots of homeschooling, for example, those kind of things. Um, it was interesting. Um, just as a personal note, I was going to a college visit with my 17-year-old and that came up. One of we were in a big room and they were talking with the at, at this college and they were talking about recruiters and they said, "Well, what?" This was a high school kid who asked, "Well, what if I've been homeschooled the whole time?" When they're talking about transcripts and all those kind of things. Now, my oldest wants to be an engineer, and so this was kind of a high, high level engineering school, and they were fine with that. So they've re reevaluated the formal education standards. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, they do not want to be tracked. Um, so that's why they don't use Facebook, for example. Facebook is for old people. Um, they don't particularly, they like Instagram for social, uh, you know, exchanges. I think Instagram is the global kind of Facebook, but 
Snapchat is huge, and it's not, not just to do bad things. Uh, like when it first came out, it's just the way they it's just the way they communicate. And another app called Whisper, and yes, I had to admit it. I had to look this up. My kids don't use it. At least they don't admit to it. Um, but it's a proprietary mobile app um, that is is a form of anonymous social media that uh, users can post and share photo and video messages, messages anonymously. Um, I will say one of my two sons, the, the younger one, talks with his friends on Snapchat all the time. Um, and I actually joined it so I can follow him. And I know he, I don't get to see everything, but that's just the way they talk, which I thought was interesting. Um, this statistic, and I have noticed it, 79%, 79% of uh, uh, global, sorry, I missed that, that one, display symptoms of emotional distress when kept away from their personal electronic devices. 79% of the globals display symptoms of emotional distress when kept away from their personal electronic devices. That comes to play in the workplace, as you can well imagine. Um, and I still see that. I'm seeing less, less um, irritation with older boomer management when they walk by and see, and it's millennials too, on, with their phone and they're texting. Um, but it still can be an issue because that's just how, particularly the globals, communicate. They don't call, they just text, or they snap. So some motivators, all right. With millennials, they want more time off. They will take unpaid time off. Um, they will take. They will kind of want time off in the first year of employment, even if it means that they don't get paid because they have things they want to do. And millennials, um, that, that's a big thing with them. This is millennials are a very experiential uh, generation. Um, they want things and they want to do things. Uh, this generation is not still uh, not well known for um, saving money. Uh, I know of several instances where I, I have friends who have older kids, one of which was working a six-figure job um, as an in engineering and um, quit and went with his wife to live in New Zealand and work as a bartender, much to their parents' dismay, because he wanted to experience that. Um, luckily, he was able to get his job back, but um, that, that, that's something that I don't know about you, but as a, as a boomer slash Gen Xer, I, I wouldn't even have entered my mind when, when I was when I was in my twenties. If I had a six-figure job, I would be staying there. Um, they want continual learning. Um, that that's one of the things you can do to keep the millennial. Uh, and they want it in multiple channels, which means they want to be able to receive their learning face to face. They want to do online. They want to do blended. Um, if you want to motivate them, offer them the ability to travel, and of course, they need flexible 
travel schedules. Um, both of these generations, that is one of the similarities, is that they are very big on having flexible schedules because they have stuff to do. All right. Um, non motivated non monetary motivational factors for millennials. Uh, they they do like mentoring as as do uh, the globals. They do want instant feedback. If you are a workplace that does yearly evals, that will make that will make millennials very uncomfortable. They, they want instant feedback all the time. It doesn't have to be in depth, but it has to be constant. Okay. Um, they want to talk about relationships as opposed to structure in the workplace. Um, they want experiential rewards and recognitions. So um, instead of giving them monetary rewards, they would prefer a trip or some kind of uh, uh, reward in that, that regard. They also want a healthy works healthy workspace, and I like this quote that I was one of the articles I was reading. Is, Sitting, they say, is the new smoking, uh, which has given rise to the um, adjustable desks. Um, the which I don't know. I'm just I, that seems horrible. Stuff standing up all day. I've had those jobs and I didn't find it particularly stimulating, but healthy workforce. So um, they are still a generation that is motivated by things like beanbag chairs and food, but they want healthy food. So you want to, uh, you want to think about those kind of things. And, and I will say that this drives some people I know up the wall, they want a stimulating and fun workplace. So your workplace needs to be fun. Don't ask me how to accomplish that because every workplace is different, but they want a stimulating and fun workplace. All right, now the globals. Interestingly enough, one of the uh, biggest things that um, popped up in many surveys uh, back all the way back to 2016, which would have been right when this generation was uh, entering the workforce, was health insurance. Uh, they want health insurance. They want mentoring, which is a face-to-face -face mentoring program or a mentoring program online, it doesn't matter. And this generation is more about money. So they do want competitive salaries. Um, sometimes I have noticed that uh, the salary requests are a little bit, um, uh, how do I say this, unreasonable. Uh, one had gotten some recent job applications, um, but this, some of that just goes with youth, regardless of what generation you were born into. Uh, some of the things that motivates them that are non-monetary are, are, again, that a boss that they can respect. Um, and again, that's not necessarily the boss's friend of the longest. It, it just that you need to earn their respect by having the knowledge that they need. They do, do, do like face-to-face -face communication and the ability to pursue their passion. Um, this, this is a generation that talks about uh, 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 corporate, corporate responsibility and, and being a good company and they wanna work for a, a good company. All right, and they, they want to be able to do things that, that make a difference, and they hope that their, their company uh, 
will also do those things. So um, I don't, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and I've noticed this is kind of an off <laughs> that we have a, uh, on the, in our office building, one of the subsidiaries of Phyllis, Philip Morris happens to be here under their new name. And most of the people I see coming out of that office are older folks, uh, not so many globals. So uh, interesting because you know cigarettes are bad. They like challenges and excitements. Like they, they too want some experiential rewards, but, but they are, are more about studies are showing that they're more about the money. But this last one is access to up-to-date technology. Don't be this office. I've read some studies, and I, I, I happen to belong to SHRM, which is the Society for Human Resource uh, and Development uh, Management. And, and um, one of the things that they said in their interviewing, one of their interviewing things, is if, if a global or even a younger millennial walks through an office and they see old technology sitting at people's desks, hopefully you don't, none of you have anything quite this old, but they won't work for you, which is a huge shift in mindset for uh, many baby boomers and um, Gen Xers because a lot of people have that thought, well, it works, why do I need to replace it? Well, you gotta remember that this is the generation that updates everything they own every two to three years. So if they walk through your office and see old tech, um, they will not want to work for you, which is tough. All right, the differences. Globals tend to be less focused. You're like, Paul, what do you mean by that? Well, basically what I mean is that, that Because they live in a world of continuous updates, they process their information a lot faster than some other generations, that, that attention cycle. So their attention span um, might be significantly lower uh, than other generations, and I don't know that that's a, that's a bad thing, um, but, and I've seen this in person, I talk about in school where um, you, you, you have a global and they will create a document on their school computer, do research on their phone or tablet while taking notes on a notepad, and also have either music or a movie running on, and I've seen my son do this, so he'll be working on his homework, and then he'll have his headphones on, and then he'll be watching a movie on his phone, all at the same time. And that would disturb me normally, right? But he gets good grades. So um, it's they can they have the ability, and, and one of the reports I said that actually says that they think that uh, global their brains are actually starting to adapt, um, which I thought was quite quite interesting. So when we as this generation moves into the into the workforce as they are, I want you to sit back and take a moment and think about what that's going to do to the workplace. 
place. And we'll talk about that in, in later on. Um, they are born social. Uh, I thought that this was interesting. 92% of them has, have a digital footprint. Um, so they are always constantly uh, looking for new things and, and because of that attention span and the ability to multitask, uh, I think that um, it's, it's just going to change the the the, the um, it's going to change the complex or the uh, face of your workforce quite quite a bit. Um, this is interesting. I, I spoke about this earlier. They are highly dependent on their devices. But um, 25, they found that uh, globals, and this is from a survey, 25% uh, more likely than millennials to say they are addicted to their digital devices. And a, a full 40% of globals are self-identified digital device addicts. But, but then they grew up with them so it's it's i don't know that that's a huge a bad thing it depends on what that does but if they're addicted to their devices because they want to be able to research at the drop of a hat which they do um which is a parent it's interesting because you say something and you better be right because they're going to look it up right in front of you and maybe challenge you on, on an opinion you have, which is keeps you, helps keep you sharp, I guess. Um, but this isn't necessarily saying that they're like addicted to texting or addicted to looking at Facebook. Like many older people are, it's just they need their device because they, they do so many different things on it. Uh, as I said, that's how they talk. So, um, and we're going to see. I think we're, we're going to start seeing, and I've already we've already started seeing it. You know, a shift towards away from things like traditional media. Um, towards uh, targeting things like advertising on Snapchat and, and Instagram and uh, all those ways that this generation communicates. Ah, Chris. Sorry. Everybody see Chris's comment. I can definitely understand kids having a digital footprint. Basically, on the first day of life, I've not yet meant to see someone about my age that has had a child that hasn't taken multiple pictures on the, of their child on the day they were born and then posted them to digital media. And that's true. Good point, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, I haven't seen. And, Yeah, probably did that by the time when my second child was born, because that's about the time Facebook started. So, what are some of the other differences? Um, they are ten millennials are generally have generally been focused on the present, where globals are future focused, um, and, and this is an I don't mean to say this. this is kind of a quote from an article, but um, millennials grew up as optimists, told that they were special and deserved the best the world they have to offer. Um, there's kind of been a backlash against that, and you probably noticed it. Um, so the parents of generation or the global 
syllables have kind of been discouraged from this kind of smothering and coddling, um, which has caused globals to be a lot more self-focused and self-directed. Um, they also tend, because they're in kind of a flashback to the way I was with my friends, I mean, I had working parents, and I was kind of left on my own. I had strong friend groups, and, and that's a term that I've gotten from my kids, uh, is a friend group. Um, is, and it's not necessarily, you know, like we think of friends on Facebook, but it's, it's both. It's kids that hang together at school and then offline and they might game together or and they they do go outside uh, and they they hang together uh, um, in person and away from the homes so that kind of that kind of group and I think we're seeing a lot more of that as opposed to the kids sitting by themselves in the basement uh, just playing on video games um, this was interesting. Their choice and method of communication, while both of these generations are digital, um, the globals on average have five screens and use images, a lot more emojis and those kind of things, where millennials uh, stick with two screens and, and texting. Chris, you can. Any other millennial and, and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I th also thought that it was interesting that, that um, global seem to have higher expectations than the millennials, and um, what even millennials and definitely Gen Xers and globals. Uh, took as an amazing or an inspiring uh, uh, invention are now looked at as givens by the globals. Um, and if they're not, if they don't get someplace fast on the internet, they think something's wrong. The biggest issue I think we have in my household sometimes is we don't have enough bandwidth. So, well, and when I've got, you know, in the evenings after homework is done, when I've got one kid downstairs uh, uh, playing a huge multiplayer game with his friends uh, using audio and video, or at least audio, and then yeah, obviously what's on the screen in these huge open world games. So then I've got my other son upstairs on his computer while streaming. YouTube videos or watching, and he actually does watch political commentary uh, on his phone. And then my wife and I are trying to watch a movie uh, on cable because we're old. Um, <laughs> people are yelling because there's lag. I'll, I hear my son in the basement, particularly. There's horrible lag. So they just expect things to happen and things to happen quickly. Um, so I think that's interesting. And this next slide is kind of a is kind of a wrap up of some of the differences between the millennials and the globals. Uh, and I I I like this I. Adapted it from an infographic that I found at Colorado 
State University. But millennials are about text messages, where globals are more about images. Uh, millennials are optimists, and globals are more realists. Interesting enough that millennials want to be discovered, and that globals want to work hard for success. Um, as far as maturity, sorry, Chris, that, that many uh, millennials have, are going through a prolonged adolescence where, uh, I don't think it's you, uh, <laughs> uh, where globals are up aging, and I've, I've, I've noticed that I've, I've noticed that, that with quite a, a few of the, the globals that I've run into. Um, and then millennials want flexible variety and a lot, a lot of experiences, where globals want flexible stability, which is is, is good news from an employer standpoint. I think. The other thing that I thought, and I, I kind of took it off of this infographic, but one of the things that was interesting is that uh, they were talking about entertainment and, and then kind of went deep into, into what this was, but they said millennials, their entertainment was more fantasy, like Harry Potter. Where globals are more dystopian, uh, like Hunger Games and, and that kind of thing, uh, shapes the, shapes their outlook on the world. So when you throw that into the mix, um, you can kind of see the realist optimist. It, it was an interesting, interesting look on, on the uh, interesting take on the two difference between the two generations. So, so, so how is this going to affect your workplace? Interesting statistic. 20, by 2025, 75% of the global workplace will be millennials and globals. And I'll be just about ready to retire. So, um, but it's still interesting. 75% will be globals and millennials. And it may be more than that, um, as more and more and more boomers are retiring. And we'll talk about that. So I kind of altered this little cartoon. Um, and this is kind of puts it in, in perspective is that they're in the driver's seat. Globals and the millennials are in the driver's seat. So my, in my last presentation, I had a giant train that was the millennials, and now it's a steamroller, because times they are, are changing. So it is going to change. It is going to change. Modes of communication are already beginning to shift. So I hope most people know how to text, but I hope most of you know how to snap because that's a way to talk to people, which is not very good for the workplace, but it's still the way a lot of people talk. Um, HR departments are going to need to offer more tools uh, that are inspired by things like 
social media and video services and real time base feedback programs to engage this these two generations. So the the thought of gathering everybody together and having a lecture uh, or a company meeting um, does not appeal to your younger generation. Now, getting everybody together possibly and having a large, large uh, session on um, On Skype, for example, uh, that's that's different. So if you if you're not a Skype user, uh, maybe you need to be, or a program like that, or programs like this. Although we can't see each other, um, and Skype you can. So um, my company is starting to do that. Um, you, they're also looking as this generation takes over. Um, they're looking at ways to to maximize and speed up. Remember, that's kind of a theme. You know, think bandwidth. They're thinking of ways to speed up the workflow and are and start to question standing relationships because again that, that that harkens back to the thought that we just, just don't we don't take anything for granted and the fact that you've had that you've been doing business with this person for the last five years doesn't mean anything to me, and these are your new managers, remember, uh, that are up and coming. It's more about what is the most efficient way and the quickest way to get something done. I think that's going to make a lot of baby boomers uncomfortable because a lot of times, you know, we get, we'll get comfortable uh, with the relationship with somebody, and we just take it for granted, and we don't really look for new ways to do. Um, thank you, Heather. Thank you. It'll, you can watch the rest. It's recorded. Um, you can look for, they're going to look for ways to cut through the chafe, for example. Um, so that's going to make a lot, a lot of people uncomfortable and might upset many people. And one of the other things that's already changed, and if you haven't done it already, you absolutely need to go to Glassdoor, uh, which is an employment slash work-related site, and see what people are saying about your company. Uh, and I wish I would have thought I had a time, I would have done a poll, but uh, I'd be amazed to see how many people, uh, and you can type if you feel like it, have checked Glassdoor, the website Glassdoor, to see what your company's reviews are. Because uh, the statistic says right now there are 12 million unique monthly users on Glassdoor. And um, by millennials and global. Um, and that they post reviews on your company. Thank you. They post reviews, and this can be, and it's interesting, and I've, I've looked up Aspen, and we do okay. Thank you for the poll. Um, primarily okay.
Paul, can we um, break for Stephanie Taylor has a question? Oh, can you hear me? We can. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry, I have to talk between phone and internet because I don't have audio on there. Um, it's not a question. I, I just was going to point out that because I have a 17-year-old daughter and I'm loving this because I'm like, yep, 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 yep. Um, she literally just got a new job two weeks ago, so, and she's the one that pulled the glass door for me and said, well, here, Mom, it says they're paying like $9 an hour. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so she sort of just goes about her part-time job by using those kind of methods without me even directing her. So you're right on. Oh, thank you. 